Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Pete Caval. Um, I can see a few names that I recognise and also some that I don't. So um, I'm a senior lecturer in the Melbourne School of Psychological Sciences um, and uh, I co-direct the FEEL Lab um, where we study uh, basically emotional functioning in daily life. Um, and we use especially experience sampling methods to do this, which is, I guess, why Paul has asked me to come here and talk a little bit about uh, experience sampling methods um, and specifically about our app called SEMA3. So um, just, just for context, the reason that I'm here is because I actually wanted to come and hear Simon Dennis's talk, which is coming up shortly. So I asked Paul if I could attend uh, as, a, as an audience member and he said, I suppose so, Pete, if you wouldn't mind doing a short introduction to um, experience sampling and SEMA. So I couldn't say no, because um, I, I wanted to attend the, the more interesting second part of this workshop, which I look forward to. So I, in the interest of getting to that more interesting part, I'm going to try and move pretty quickly through this intro. Um, also, because I suppose many of you are already somewhat familiar with experience sampling and you probably know most of this. Um, but if, if anything is unclear or unfamiliar, feel free to stop me. So um, I'll, I'll try and go through a few sort of basic questions. And as I said, I'll move pretty quickly. So first of all, um, what is the experience sampling method or ESM uh, is, the, is the popular acronym for it? What is it? Well, um, you're probably familiar with random sampling of participants from a population. Uh, so this is where you, you, know, you get a population and you pick randomly some members of that population to uh, form a sample that you want to study and then draw inferences about the population as a whole. Well, experience sampling takes the same kind of logic and applies it to time points or occasions or situations. So you can think of you know, each of these, any of these people as having their life being made up of um, you know, a population of occasions or time points. And with experience sampling, what we try and do is get a random sampling of those time points. So we, we pick uh, some of these time points to um, look at in detail and ask, you know, what are people doing and what's happening to them and what are they thinking and feeling at those times? So what this looks like, um, if we follow this blue stick person throughout, uh, say, one day in their life, um, you know, this is the start of the day and this person is just sort of hanging around. And then uh, later on, they're going for a little walk and we, we sample them at that exact moment. Uh, a little bit later, they might be reading a book. And again, we sample that particular occasion and we ask them some questions, let's say. And then later on, they're moving to another location. Uh, then they're having an interaction. Um, then they're feeling maybe a little low, having a cup of coffee, and then feeling quite, quite good and excited. And what you can see is that across this day, um, they've done lots of different things and been in lots of different places. And we've only sampled some of those. So if we haven't, those smartphone images represent the times that we've sampled or the occasions that we've sampled. So we haven't captured everything, but hopefully we've got a representative random sampling of the kinds of things they do and the places they are and so on. And experience sampling you can think of as um, part of a, a broader group of methods, which I think is often called ambulatory assessment methods or intensive longitudinal methods, at least in the kind of literature that I tend to read. Um, so we can distinguish between, um, I think, two different types of these broader uh, ambulatory assessment methods. There are active methods and passive methods. The active methods are the ones like experience sampling um, or daily diaries. Um, EMA is another term, which stands for ecological momentary assessment, which require participants to actively respond. Uh, in, in the case of ESM or experience sampling, um, this involves self-reports. So telling me how you're feeling, what you're thinking and so on. But there are also other kinds of methods. And um, I think maybe Simon will talk a little bit about those uh, in a moment which are also ambulatory. They happen outside of the lab in daily life. They involve repeated assessments, but they are passive methods in that they don't require participants to actually do anything. They're sort of happening in the background, tracking people's behaviours, movements, maybe their physiology and so on. Now, ESM, or experience sampling, is often, you often see it touted as a new method, but that, I think that's not quite right. I think it's definitely been around for quite some time. So just very briefly, you can see evidence of this going back at least to the 1920s in the psychological 
research record. Um, this is quite a seminal study here by um, Flugel uh, on actually on feelings and emotions in daily life uh, using paper and pencil kind of diaries or records. And then um, it picked up again in the 70s and 80s um, with Csikszentmihalyi and Larson's very famous uh, validation of the experience sampling method and that, that term was coined. Um, people used at that time smart kind of smart watches which could be programmed uh, to beep at certain random moments throughout the day and participants would then fill in a paper and pencil uh, experience sampling survey. In around the early 2000s, uh, if you're old enough, you might remember these palm top computers, which came about and uh, researchers jumped on these experience sampling researchers. Um, and in particular, Lisa Feldman Barrett and Daniel Barrett published uh, a, a software package for palm top, uh, palm OS, uh, which could be used to program experience sampling so computerized, the first computerized experience sampling. And nowadays um, smartphones are the the most often used tools for experience sampling research. Both active and passive methods obviously can be um, applied using smartphones. So you might think, well, that all sounds okay, but why should I bother? Um, so very briefly, let me try and convince you why, why you should. And, and specifically why you should bother doing self-report methods, because that's, that's what I'm particularly interested in. Um, in research on emotion, um, it's understood that emotions are not just one thing. They comprise multiple components, including experience, but also behavior and physiology, for example. So why bother asking people how they feel? Well, um, a number of uh, important emotion researchers and theorists have argued that um, the subjective experience of emotion is essential uh, to emotion. Maybe it's not a uh, sufficient uh, you know, to, to, to capture emotion, but it's certainly an essential feature. Others have actually said that uh, emotional experience is, is essentially is tantamount to emotion and everything else is just a correlate of emotion. Um, and so, you know, there's certainly, there seems to be, um, you know, this kind of central place given to subjective experience. And if we want to capture subjective experience, uh, at least at the moment, the only way we can do that is by asking people to self-report. Now, if we're going to ask people to self-report, what's the problem with doing so, for example, using traditional um, retrospective or global questionnaires, or perhaps in a lab setting where we can control, control things? Well, the, the, those things are certainly valid methods, but um, lab studies we know have problems with generalizing to outside of the lab. Um, and this, this is, you know, sometimes talked about as a lack of ecological validity. So, now, if you encounter a zombie in Minecraft, that's not quite the same as encountering one in, in real life, um, as you may be familiar with yourself. Um, and so what we do with experience sampling is we get out of those artificial lab settings and we, we, we try and understand psychological processes as they occur in people's real lives. Um, we also know that asking people to recall uh, how they felt or what they were thinking in a previous time is possible and people can give you reliable answers, but those answers are quite different to uh, how they actually felt at that moment when they were experiencing something. So this is something known as the memory experience gap, which um, Kahneman and many others have, have researched extensively. So if we, if we want to understand emotional experience as it occurs, we need to capture it more or less in real time and experience sampling allows us to do this. And finally, experience is dynamic. It's, it's constantly fluctuating, and particularly this applies to emotion and feelings. Uh, and so experience sampling allows us to get this rich time series of uh, subjective feelings, which we can then look at and describe those dynamics and perhaps try and explain what, what processes govern those and drive those. So how do you do it? Well, um, one way of thinking about what experience sampling is, um, is it's essentially just a, a questionnaire or a survey um, that's delivered these days again via smartphones most often. Uh, here are some kinds of questions that you might ask in a typical ESM survey. You know, how are you feeling? What are you thinking? What are your goals or desires? Uh, what, what have you been doing recently? Who are you with? And so on. Um, maybe asking about appraisals of the context. How important is it? How much are you able to control it? Etc. Um, now, 
I'm here to plug uh, SEMA3, which is a, um, uh, basically a suite of software for conducting ESM or uh, EMA, which is another term that's used for the same sort of thing, um, experience sampling research using smartphone apps. Um, and it's a, it's a platform that works on both Android and, and uh, iOS devices that we uh, developed here and manage at the University of Melbourne. Um, so in the field lab, in conjunction with the Melbourne E Research Group, who actually do the software development. And so SEMA3, I'll tell you a little bit about it and I'll give you give it a bit of a plug. But if you want um, to look at what are the other options, this is a great resource that I've linked to at the bottom. There's a hyperlink there. Um, so you can click on that and see you know, a spreadsheet put together by Ruben Arslan and, and Carolyn Zigar looking at all the different ESM apps and, and software solutions available for you. SEMA3 is free. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to profit at all if you uh, start using it. In fact, it creates more work for me. But um, you'd be joining sort of legions of researchers at, you know, dozens and dozens of universities and research institutes now in over 50 countries that are using SEMA. Um, so, it seems to work relatively well for lots of different people. Uh, we do get complaints, but but generally people are satisfied. Um, and it's soon to be featured as well on a, uh, an, an episode of ABC Catalyst. Uh, at least so I'm told um, that uh, for, for my for my hard work, I'll get some kind of a <laughs> reward in terms of it being mentioned in this episode, for uh, which it was used to to study the effects of some intervention on people in daily life. So um, what is SEMA? Well, it's made up of a few different components. There's a, there's a web app, which is used to design the surveys and uh, schedules um, for delivering the surveys on people's smartphones. And that's hosted on an instance of the Nectar uh, cloud server. Um, then we have two mobile apps, which were written in React Native. It's a cross-platform language. And so we have an Apple um, iOS app and an, a Google uh, Android app. And these two things communicate with each other via um, Firebase, uh, Google's Firebase um, cloud platform. And that's where we basically store the data as well. So that's what's going on behind the scenes, I'm told. Um, now, in terms of the features, I, I won't go through all of these because there's many, but the first important thing is it's free. Um, so if you want to do research using this method, you can sign up and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. And there's lots and lots of features that I'm going to have to skip through because I see that I'm I'm going to otherwise run you know terribly over time. Let me just give you a bit of a, um, a quick demonstration of what a SEMA study structure looks like. So we have a study that you can create, and you can within that have surveys, uh, multiple surveys. Each of those surveys can have multiple sets of questions, which contain obviously multiple questions. Um, Typically, you would have a structure like this with just one survey per study, but you can have more than one survey in a study, which gives you lots of flexibility in terms of how to design um, the, the kinds of questions and logic that you want your participants to go through in terms of answering questions in a particular order and so on. Lots of randomization and branching options as well. Um, the most common type of question that question type that people use, uh, slider questions. You might ask people right now, how anxious do you feel? And they respond using this sort of sliding scale. But we have other kinds of question types as well. One is a, a choice question, um, is an example of a recent item that we've used. And you can allow single choices or multiple choices. And we can also include things like grid questions like this. Um, so for example, here we ask people to indicate how they're feeling right now using this emoji grid, um, which represents feelings uh, in a two-dimensional space using these visual emojis. Um, I was gonna show you how to create a schedule, but I'm gonna skip over this, otherwise I'll run out of time. And there are tutorials and videos um, on SEMA, on the SEMA website, which show you how to set up a study if you're interested in doing this yourself. Just one other thing I wanna highlight is that a great feature that we built in not that long ago is personalized feedback. So at the end of a study, we're able to show our participants uh, graphs like this of their responses over time. So this is a participant's responding to the question, how anxious do you feel over about a week? 
and we can overlay that with another time series of their responses to another question. So for example, here, this is the same person's responses to um, the question, uh, how strong was the strongest negative event that's occurred since the last survey? And you can see there's, you know, you can visually sort of see the correlation or perhaps causal relationship between these variables. Um, and this hopefully is incentivizing to participants to give you, you know, valid and um, reliable data uh, because they will know that they can get some insight into their own emotional or other kinds of psychological processes at the end of the study. So if you're interested in CIMA, please check out the, the video manuals uh, on our website. And um, if you want to register as a researcher, you can, you can do that at this link. Um, and there are some, some troubleshooting tips there as well. And we also do have uh, email support, which is somewhat limited by uh, limited resources, but can provide some support. Now, if you say that this all sounds too hard, um, I don't blame you. Um, where can you find some existing ESM data? Well, we're just about to launch uh, a really exciting database called the Emote database. Uh, Paul has been involved in helping us to set this up. And this is a database of uh, 26 existing experience sampling data sets that we collected over the course of many years, um, also with some collaborators in Belgium. So it's, it's data from roughly 5,000 participants measured at about 200,000 occasions of time. Um, so it's a very rich database and uh, it'll be searchable. The data are coded so that you can easily find um, constructs or, or, or variables that you're interested in. And you'll be able to um, request access to these data. And then once that's approved through a kind of vetting process, you'll be able to access these data in anonymized or de-identified form and, and analyze them. Um, so for example, if you searched for uh, SAD in this searchable database, this would show you, you know, there's you know, a dozen or more studies that measured sadness in some way, and then you can request to um, you know, download one or more of those. This is still in the testing phase, so um, please don't get too excited, uh, but, but, but get mildly excited because we're very close to being able to make these data available publicly uh, to anyone who is you know, a qualified researcher and um, registers through the, the, the formal process of requesting to access these data. It's not too onerous a process, just requires answering some basic questions and agreeing to abide by some conditions. Now, what do these data look like? Well, they're multi-level, um, meaning that we have a sort of a structure where we have multiple individuals who have been sampled at multiple occasions of time. And so you can think of these as having a, a hierarchical or multi-level structure um, with time points or occasions nested within each individual. And in long format, this is what the data would look like. So you'll have, you know, here you've got three hypothetical people assessed at five time points on two variables, X and Y. Um, so you end up with this very, very long data, um, which you know is typically analyzed, at least again in the literature in the field that I work in, using mixed effects models or multi-level models to account for this kind of hierarchical structure. Um, a way of thinking about these data is, um, you know, if you've got X and Y observed at multiple occasions of, over time for multiple individuals, um, you can think about um, the kind of the mean score for each individual across all the time points as representing a sort of their trait level of each variable. And this is what we're talking about when we look at the between person or between individual level, the upper level of our multi-level models that we typically use to analyze these data. And we can also think about um, the within person or, or time specific deviations um, around each person's stable mean or trait level of, of each variable um, for a particular occasion or time point. And this is what we look at when we look at sort of the lower level, the within person level of, uh, of our models, of our analyses. So we sort of, we, could, we want to try and pull apart these two distinct independent levels of analysis. And, um, you know, in some cases you can have uh, different relationships between variables at these different levels of analysis. So in this very hypothetical example here, um, you can think of these dots, these data points 
uh, coming from four different people uh, at multiple occasions. And what you can see just by sort of eyeballing the data is that at the between person level, there's a positive association between X and Y in this example. Um, but at the within person level for any given individual, it's actually in the opposite direction. There's actually a negative association between X and Y. Now this is sort of a highly contrived example, but it isn't uncommon to see differences between the uh, direction or, or, or at least strength of the associations between variables at these two different levels of analysis. So they're not necessarily the same, only under very specific circumstances, which are not that common in psychology at least, um, are they the same? And, and failing to sort of properly distinguish or uh, separate these levels um, is, is, you know, uh, tantamount to committing a, the, the, the ecological fallacy or what's also known as Simpson's paradox. So at this between person level, um, we can really only make inferences about um, correlations or associations. It's, it's difficult often to draw causal inferences about the effects that we observe at the between person level in this kind of multi-level data structure um, because we're, we're talking about overall means uh, or, or variances in some cases um, of something that's been observed repeatedly over time. And if we find that the mean level of X is associated with the mean level of Y, that tells us something, but we don't know whether X causes Y or vice versa. It's difficult to make that inference. It's a little bit easier to make that inference, or we at least have some way of trying um, at the within person level. And we can do this by um, essentially looking at the, the temporal structure of the, the data, or I suppose capitalizing on the temporal structure of the data. So one way of thinking about this is that we can create, for example, lagged versions of our observed variables, X and Y. So you can think of X at time point T, and then we create a version of X at time point T minus one, the previous time point. So by just shifting the data down by one occasion of measurement, for example. And in doing this, what we're then able to do is estimate models like, like this, cross lag models. Um, and this is sort of where I'm gonna end my talk in a moment, um, almost right on time, um, because this is sort of uh, the, the frontiers of my own uh, knowledge in terms of how to try and understand uh, causality in these kinds of time series data and hopefully will be a great um, uh, segue into Simon's talk which will give us I think some some better maybe newer insights into how to make causal inferences from such data um, but what what most people that I uh, again work with and in the literature that I work in do is use these kinds of cross lag models and what that allows us to do is to say okay well since we have repeated measurements of these variables over time. At the within person level, we can look at how variables predict themselves across time. And um, when we do that, we're estimating autoregressive effects or autoregressive slopes for each of our variables. These tell us about the degree of persistence or um, carryover or inertia, if you like, of these variables. And we can also look at cross-lagged effects. Um, and the cross-lagged effects, if we estimate a model like this, um, in theory, allow us to make causal or at least pseudo-causal inferences about how one variable precedes another, causes another uh, in time. So these cross-lagged effects are often given in such a model um, a, a causal interpretation. So, um, that's where I wanted to end. Uh, I'm happy to take questions or, or comments, of course. Um, and if you are interested in learning more, I've just got some links here to, to other resources for you. So um, a bit more of an in-depth introduction into ESN by a colleague, Elise Kalakarinos is the first one, um, and some other, uh, some other links to other workshops and uh, uh, websites and books that might be of interest if this is uh, something that you're new to. So thanks very much and happy to take some questions. If there's time, Paul. Um, I mean, it's really up to Simon, but 
I think we could go straight into his talk if you would like to. Okay. Um, I think there's time for one or two questions if there's if anyone has one. Uh, Hi, Pete. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, you go, go sign to one. I'll come later. <laughs> We're both too polite. Um, okay, <laughs> I'll go. Um, thanks, Pete. That was super um, interesting, especially because I'm planning on starting my first ESM study soon, so also very timely. Um, I just had a couple of practical questions about SEMA. So mm -hmm. firstly, how is the data stored initially in SEMA and could it be used in European universities given the GDPR requirements? Uh, yes, it's stored um, essentially here in Australia, um, but it can be used by European universities. It has been used by, by people at many uni European universities. Um, the GDPR requirements, as far as I understand, um, SEMA is compliant with those. And in some cases, we have been asked to sign a formal kind of GDPR uh, compliance agreement or, or data uh, transfer agreement with uh, universities. And that can be done at some potential expense to the person wanting to sign that agreement with us. Um, because of the time and, and you know resources that are required to actually have that properly you know processed, but basically the answer is yes. Um, the GDPR requirements, the main requirement, as far as I'm aware, is the ability to remove data, delete data, which we can do uh, upon request. And so um, that I think, and obviously the the kind of um, absence of personally identifying information, which is something that's really uh, built into SEMA as much as possible. Uh, is means that it's 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 possible to use it outside of Australia. Yes. Awesome. That's great news. Thanks. Um, also, is there the capacity to incorporate your own JavaScript alongside SEMA when you're giving each of the um, uh, uh, EMA um, things? Uh, I only partially understand the question, Haley. I apologise, but I, I I mean I suppose that you could do anything you wanted. Um, but you, uh, SEMA is in theory open source, um, but we haven't yet made the source code available, uh, widely available because it's undergoing continuous improvements and so on. So if you wanted to edit the source code yourself, that would be possible in theory. And we, we would be happy to share the source code with somebody who wanted to do that as long as they, we can come to some agreement about you know, making sure it doesn't break, essentially. Um, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, though. Um, yeah, no, I think that's fine. Um, just if I wanted to play around with the visualizations of any of the um, parts of SEMA or add um, video elements or those sorts yeah. of things. There's probably other, to be honest with you, there are probably other platforms that might suit you better um, if that's what you want to do. SEMA is mainly designed for somebody like me who doesn't really know what JavaScript is and wants to just run an ESM study. Um, so there's a few other options that I can chat with you about offline. Oh, good. Thank you. Maybe I might just uh, put in a, a word there. Is the, um, so React is a JavaScript um, platform. Um, so, so, React, um, so the React Native that, that Seema's built on um, uses, it, it's, you program in JavaScript and then that gets compiled into a native um, app. Um, so yeah, you you are at least starting with JavaScript. So. That's good to know. Um, yeah, hi Peter. It's a long time to see as well, but uh, I see more. Um, good to see you. Good to see you, and thanks for you know talking about this. I've been interested in this for a while now, and uh, um, I was wondering also from a practical point of view, um, what does it actually cost to run a study like this? You know, I, I know that. I've always been a bit afraid about uh, collecting longitudinal data. data. Um, yeah. Is, yeah. How much does it cost? And what are the incentives for the participants? Um, how do you deal with dropouts? How realistic yeah. is it actually to, to run uh, an ambitious study? I'm, I'm conscious of the, the time, so I want to give a, a concise answer. Um, the concise answer is you're right to be scared because it is a fairly substantial undertaking and it can be costly but um, 
I'm not, I don't want to be too pessimistic. It is certainly something that you can do on a limited budget. The main challenges are that um, you need to maintain engagement with your participants and ma maintain their motivation uh, to avoid attrition or careless responding and so on, because this is the kind of study where as soon as the participant, you know, if you ever meet them face to face, um, that's a great start. That's how we've traditionally done experience sampling, where we set up a baseline or sort of induction meeting at the beginning to try and build some kind of rapport and give the participant a, a reason to care about doing the study. In times of COVID, that's not possible anymore. Um, and so uh, it's difficult to establish that initial rapport and it's, it's difficult to maintain engagement with people who you never meet. But it's certainly possible and... So I'm happy to chat more, you know, offline about the details, but financial incentives are typically used. And for a week long study, you might pay anywhere in the realm of, you know, 20 to $50 per participant, depending on the nature of the study um, and the nature of the sample. Um, so, but it can be done for, for nothing as well. And that's one of the reasons why we built in the personalized feedback feature as a, in an attempt to try and give people an intrinsic motivation for doing, uh, for participating in such research. Yeah, I was I was wondering about that specifically whether you know that's be, that's actually a feature that people really enjoy and if that's kind of um, pushing them over the edge to keep contributing. I think we still need to work that out systematically, but that's that's the hope. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right, well, um, yeah, unless there are any other burning questions, perhaps we should um, hand over to Simon, um, if that's okay. Okay, sounds good. I'll um, stop my share if I can somehow. Here we go. There we go. Set one up. Okay, um, hi everyone. And yeah, so uh, I think hopefully this will kind of segue reasonably nicely, particularly from um, uh, what uh, Pete was saying there at the end about the um, uh, causal relations and, and how to infer those. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll have more to say about that. Um, I'm not, as you'll see though, I have some reservations about the lagged um, kind of approach, but, uh, but yeah, I'll let you uh, make up your own mind about the, um, this alternative. So um, what I'm gonna do today is um, talk about um, a specific method called convergent cross mapping, which is, um, as Pete foreshadowed, a method for um, extracting causal relationships um, between variables. And it's really, so it's a specific method for, for understanding how to do the analysis, um, but it, it's embodied in a broader set of, of notions of um, how should we go about trying to understand um, any time varying um, kind of phenomena. Um, but in particular, I'll be um, focusing on psychological phenomena um, where, you know, out in the real world where um, there are potentially um, lots of interacting factors um, and where uh, causality might actually require a, a kind of conceptual change as well. Um, so I'm going to do that. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Unforgettable, which is the, um, the uh, service that um, our company runs and uh, which is a source of data for, um, for these kinds of studies. So what I'm going to hopefully start. So I'm going to um, start with a little uh, video which I'm going to use to um, illustrate a um, couple of points. Uh, so just let me know in the chat if this is not coming through um, successfully because sometimes videos don't go so great. Um, but hopefully uh, this will work. Sorry, I just wanted to say too that um, this is going to run for about um, four minutes. So, so we'll be, um, uh, I'm going to make several points out of this just so you, you've, uh, I've set your expectations. This is 
Johnson. Yeah, it almost looks as good as Mom's. Stephanie, Carol worked extremely hard on this. Oh, this is, I just threw together a simple recipe. This is almost perfect. If only Kyle could have made it home for Christmas this year. Merry Christmas, Dad. Kyle, what a Christmas miracle. Anything for you, Dad. <laughs> Can we go a different route or something? Why are you even going down this street? This street is terrible this time of day. Can you double time it? Can we just get a little faster, man? I'm kind of late for a flight right now. Literally 15 minutes, I'm stressing out. Have you ever tried to check through security during the holidays? This is freaking nuts! Can you turn up the AC? Okay, remember, we can't bring up the Asian thing. What Asian thing? Shh. Can't I say Asian in my own home? So, James, um, I, I had some Thai food the other day. It was to Thai for. Oh. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, <honey. laughs> yeah. My dad, he, he's not a racist, but he might tell like a bad joke or two. Wait, what? Don't worry about it, just ignore him. Dad! Daddy! I'm Chinese, but I do love Thai food. Yeah, and we like Chinese food too. Oh, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Maybe you could cook some for us. Okay, Carol, we're done. Don't they all cook? I'm sure Chinese people cook. I said he's Chinese, do you I think, think he doesn't you know, know? I don't know much about him, I just met him also, so. Alrighty then. We normally do Christmas presents after dinner, but I just can't help myself. Whoa, the new G Phone 6, 7S, Dad. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Daddy. How'd you get this? They're sold out everywhere. Our magician never reveals his secrets. I saw it first. Well, anything for my kids. That's oh, oh, oh. Oh, Santa, everybody. It's not your brother, the big disappointment, Greg. Johnny, look, I know this has been a hard year for you with the divorce and everything, but I think for Christmas, we're just gonna do our family. I hope you understand. Oh yeah, Merry Christmas. Nobody loves Johnny. But everyone loves Santa. I'm just saying we should give Trump a chance. Okay, I think it's time to take our family Christmas picture. Mm, great idea. Yeah. yeah. The family's all here. James, get in the picture. No, no, I don't think James would be in the picture. Daddy, that's not fair. It is fair. This is a family picture. James is not family. Oh my God, that's right. so rude. Well, I'm not family yet, but I was hoping to change that tonight. Oh God. Steph, will you marry me? <laughs> Absolutely not. Daddy! What do you think you're doing? You hardly know him. I barely knew Carol when you married her. Okay. So is everyone still there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um so that oops, sorry. Um is uh a somewhat caricature caricature of a Christmas dinner. And um, I want to use it to um, illustrate a, a, a few points about um, the nature of, of interaction and um, I think outline some of what I see as the limitations in our uh, normal way of going about um, uh, trying to understand psychological phenomena. So, um, so what I did just to, for um, illustrative purposes is I went through that entire interaction. And so we've got time on the bottom here. And for each of the individuals, I made an estimate of what I thought their um, effective 
uh, state might have been. So how much happiness or how, how positive they might have been at any given point there. And so, um, so for instance, if we take uh, this point here, just before 100 seconds, this is when um, Greg, who's the father, makes his Thai food joke, uh, which he thought was hilarious, but not everybody agreed. And so, um, so I've gone through the whole conversation and, and um, looked at it um, from that perspective. So now if you think about how would we typically go about trying to um, analyze what was happening in this conversation, you know, in this um, uh, party, well, we might have taken that data and we would have plotted it out like this and we could have divided it up, divided it up by um, the individual uh, um, participants. Um, but then typically what we um, would do is we'd try to fit a linear model to it, okay? And so um, if you do that here, you find there's a, um, a, a downward trend um, that occurred during the, um, during the party. And I think we can all agree that that's an accurate um, portrayal of the of the story. Um, however, it's not necessarily all that enlightening, right? So there was a lot of lot of other things going on. Um, if we were really sophisticated, we might have tried a multi level model, and so what that would have done, right, is is come up with individual means and potentially slopes for our um, for our participants. Um, but nonetheless, mostly what we'd, we'd uh, figure out from that is that there was some kind of downward trend, right? Um, but I would argue that there was, a, there was a lot more going on there. And um, I want to illustrate a couple of, of points um, that are about how we would um, typically analyze this and why it might not be um, everything that we would want. So the, the first one, this is an, a kind of old adage in um, psychology, but I think um, here we can really start to, um, to see um, this, how, how this plays out. In, and that's that um, correlation is not causation. Okay, so we hear that all the time. And um, here we can, we can look at specific um, people and look at the um, relationships between their effective states to really point um, to show how this is um, this is the case. So for here, I, um, for this um, slide, what I've done is just taken out um, Stephanie and Kyle, who are the daughter and the um, son, and um, looked at their effective um, profiles. And you can see right that they're um, uh, pretty highly correlated, right? Um, and yet we wouldn't want to necessarily say that the driving force here was the was the interaction between the daughter and the son, right? What was really going on is that they were reacting to um, Greg for the most part, who's the father. Um, now, if you look at Greg's um, graph, it's still correlated with Stephanie's, um, but not nearly as highly as it is with, um, as, as the daughter was with the son, um, because obviously there are points like this one where, um, where uh, Greg was making his um, Thai food joke, um, where they're on quite different uh, different ends of the spectrum, um, despite being there being a strong causal relationship between those events. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is that when we um, fit a, a kind of linear model, um, we assume that all of the deviations that we see are effectively noise, right? So again, if we um, take our vignette here or our kind of specific point where Greg makes his Thai food joke, um, and we look at this, this difference between, um, say, Kyle and, and um, uh, the boyfriend and the daughter's response. Um, essentially, in the linear model, this is saying, oh, well, this is some deviation, so that's all noise. And, um, you know, we, we're kind of, we, that gets thrown away, right? We basically say that that's our error term. Uh, but I, again, I would argue that, that that's actually kind of intrinsic to this um, interaction. So uh, I think, yeah, just to remind you, uh, no, that's fine. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that bit. I think. Uh, sorry. He, he's not a racist. So the point of all that was to say, um, yeah, the real world is actually pretty complex, and in particular, um, I want to argue that um, simple ideas of cause and effect um, tend to break down. So, um, and in particular, one of the things that 
uh, people often have as a kind of notion in their in their um, understanding of cause and effect is that the cause occurs before the effect. Um, but in these um, complex systems, and I would argue a lot of psychological systems are complex in this sense, um, that might not be a sufficient um, way of understanding cause and effect. And to give you a sense of this, if you think about ecosystems, and that's where some of these techniques that I'm going to talk about come from, um, you imagine that you're plotting the population of a predator and the population of a prey, right? Now, the question is, um, which of those variables would you say is the cause and which is the effect, okay? So if we look over on the, the right here, this is a classic example. So this is um, uh, longitudinal data of, of the populations of um, the snowshoe hare and the Canadian lynx. And um, if you look at these two uh, sequences, time series here, um, you can clearly see that they're related to each other, right? But if you think about, well, what's the causality here? Well, you know, obviously, if you have more predators, then that's going to um, decrease the amount of prey because um, the predators are eating the prey, so the the, hair, um, the lynx are eating the hares. Um, but vice versa, right? If the if the um, uh, hare population drops, then there's not as much food, and so then the lynx pop, um, population drops as well, right? So there, so clearly the causation um, goes in both directions. You can't just um, say one thing causes the other thing. Um, and I, I would argue, right, that in fact, um, the real world looks much more like this um, diagram at the bottom here. It's very intertwined. It's very, um, there are a lot of different things that are coupled to each other. So, um, so the, the technique I'm going to talk about, um, convergent cross mapping, um, is a kind of method for trying to um, untangle um, these kinds of webs of, of um, kind of mutual uh, causality. Um, the other thing that you might wonder, right, is if you've got all of this, these um, complicated intertwined um, variables that you're trying to understand, um, how could you even figure out um, how, what are all the things that you need to measure in order to be able to um, understand the system? So, um, you know, one of the things that we're kind of used to coming out of um, the kind of linear world is this idea of mediators and moderators and that you, you know, um, you really have to understand what those mediators and moderators are um, in order to be able to um, understand the system and, and um, hopefully um, you measure all of those things, right? But, you know, if it's really as complex as I'm suggesting here, then um, how could we even hope to approach it? Because how could we, you know, we, how could we even know all of the variables that you would need to measure? Um, so I want to introduce the, the first hero, somewhat unlikely hero, perhaps, of this saga. Um, this is um, Floris Takens. And um, Takens developed this, um, what's the so-called delayed embedding theorem. And the, this is really a very powerful theorem. And the um, point that um, Takens makes is that all of the key properties of a um, system of variables are actually contained in the um, time series of just one of those variables, um, provided the systems are coupled, right? So, so um, all of the complicated dynamics that are um, that are part of that whole system, if they're coupled, um, are you can unravel just by looking at one of the variables, okay? Just by looking at how it unfolds in time. Um, so that's a that's a really um, powerful theorem. Now, I want to um, be clear about this, right? So he's not saying that all variables are coupled to each other, right? It's not like the, some kind of um, Zen kind of, uh, you know, um, interconnectedness of all things kind of thing. So, uh, thing. What, he, what he's saying is that if variables are coupled, then you can extract the, um, the dynamics of the entire system from any one of those variables. So for instance, if we were talking about potato farming on Mars, um, we wouldn't expect that to be coupled with say the, the Christmas party that we were just watching. So we're, so we're not saying that, you know, we can somehow um, take measurements of, of Matt Damon um, and figure out what's happening in this, in this party, right? They have to be coupled variables. 
Um, but if they are coupled variables, then, um, then this theorem um, pertains, right? So to, to try to um, give more of a sense of this, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, construct a very um, simple model of um, affect. I realize this is extremely dangerous in the, in the current company, but, the, um, but I wanna emphasize this is just a, um, you know, for the purposes of, of explication um, kind of model, not a, um, a, uh, a concerted attempt to, to understand um, affect. Um, so, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to con um, construct this model so that we can um, go through and, and look at the method and understand how each of the different um, pieces are working, right? And so in my um, model of affect, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that, um, that affect changes as a function of, of the season, so on a very um, long time scale, um, but also that, uh, so you know, one might imagine that people uh, feel more positivity during, um, during the summer, for instance. Um, and, uh, but I'm also going to assume that there's another variable, which is um, uh, how far you are from home. So assuming um, this is the time series for a person who um, is going to work daily, so you're going to work, maybe you um, have less positive affect there, then you go home, you have more positive affect and um, so forth, right? Um, now, what I'm going to assume is that uh, we have some kind of um, EMA uh, measures, perhaps something like what Pete was talking about in the previous um, uh, talk, uh, which have been um, taken over this time. And I'm going to assume for the purposes of the model that what we've done is we've taken the affect as a consequence of the season, and we've simply just added that to the affect as a consequence of the distance from home in order to get our uh, measurement of the affect um, over time. Okay, so very um, simple model. Now, what I want to uh, point out about this though, is that um, the season and the distance from home have been used to generate the affect, right? So there's a causal relationship between season and affect, right? But there's not a causal relationship between affect and season, right? And that's as you would expect, right? So you'd expect that time could potentially um, uh, affect how people feel, but you wouldn't um, expect um, how people feel to, to change the, the nature of the space-time continuum. Now, in this um, model though, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that we've thought about season as a variable and we've uh, measured affect, um, but we, ha we haven't thought about distance from home, right? So this is one of those um, un uh, unconsidered variables that you would expect would be rife when we're actually trying to do real scientific work, right? So we're not, we're going to, not going to assume the system has access to this. We're going to assume the system ha only has access to season and affect and it needs to extract what's the causal relationship between these two things, right? And what I should say in this case, right, it's just completely one way, right, for the season versus affect. But of course, one of the points of this whole exercise is that um, often the variables we'll be dealing with, there'll be mutual causality. And so the method works um, uh, regardless of whether the causality is just in one direction or is in two directions. Okay, um, the other thing to note here is that the, um, these variables, so season and affect, are highly correlated, okay? But that doesn't tell us anything about um, which one causes which. Now, um, because we developed the system, we've, we've got a, it's a model system, we can actually uh, go ahead and, and um, plot the entire system, right? Because we actually, because we developed it, because we know what the underlying variables are, um, we can uh, plot affect versus distance from home versus season. And um, here you can see um, what that looks like when we plot that um, across time. So in a sense, right, uh, in our scientific understanding of the system, this is, for, for this model system, this is the whole thing, right? This is everything that we could, um, uh, the, the kind of in, entire dynamics of, this, of the system. But of course, um, we don't have distance from home, right? So what can we do? 
So what we can do is we can apply um, Taken's theorem. So in Taken's theorem, what he says is that we can reconstruct the dynamics of um, the coupled system um, just by looking at a time delayed um, set of uh, variables. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, if we take season here and we take a um, point at one time step, and then we go a um, delta t further on to another time step, and then a delta t further on to another time step, then um, we've got a window of length three here. And now we can plot that um, over on the right hand side as a point. Okay. And if we go through and if we move this um, down another point here, and then which means this one moves down and this one moves up. Um, so further along the time frame here, then we'll get another point and we can plot that and so forth. And if you um, plot the season, what you'll find is you'll get this um, circle. And that circle is what um, is called the shadow manifold. Okay, so this is a, a, another way of kind of capturing the dynamics of this particular um, time series. Now, um, we can do the same thing for affect. Right, so if we go through here, we have our three points here because we're going to have a window of length three. Um, we plot that point, then we um, move along to the next um, set. We plot that point and so forth. Then um, we can um, plot out the um, entire um, shadow manifold for affect here. Now, um, what you might notice is that if this here, it's it's. Um, there's a kind of circular um, component to it. But if you look at the um, how the points are joined up here, you'll see there's basically a flat surface that goes around here, right? Which is this is um, a, a kind of isomorphic to the um, flat surface that um, that you see in the whole system. And so this is what takers takens is talking about, right? that, here, here we had all of the variables from the whole system. And here what we've done is reconstructed a shadow manifold, which has uh, many of the same properties as the original one. And we were able to do that from just one variable, okay, by looking at the time delays in there. And that, um, so, and the key um, thing to note here, right, is that the, um, that, this is for the affect variable, which, which contains all of the information, right? So affect has within it um, all of the information about the three variables, whereas the season doesn't, right? Season doesn't have the information about distance from home. And um, so we don't see the entire um, structure there, but we do see it down here. Um, and so that's what we're going to um, use. So now the, um, for the, the kind of second hero of our, um, of our saga. So, so that's all well and good. We can, we can figure out what the topology of that um, system is. But in order to kind of answer um, interesting questions about causality, we want to do more than that, right? We want to um, be able to understand, well, which, is, which variable is causing which variable. And so George Sugihara developed this method called convergent cross mapping um, which allows us um, to establish what the, what the causality is in this system. And so here's the idea. So remember I said, right, that affect has all of the information about everything because um, it's coupled with everything, right? It's coupled with the distance from home and it's coupled with um, season. Um, however, season does not have all of the information. It doesn't have the information about the um, distance from home, right? So if I take um, a point, a set of points um, from season, and I try to predict what points those will um, be on the affect um, time series, right? So I take, I look at this shadow manifold here, and I, I get a point from here, I get the neighbors here, I map those across to the neighbors over here, and then I take an average of those, right? So I'm basically doing a nearest neighbor prediction from, um, from the season across to affect. Now, that um, prediction is going to be compromised because the season variable doesn't have all of the information it needs to predict the affect variable um, because the distance from home is not in, um, is not in here, 
right? And so as a consequence, if the ability to predict across here is compromised, right? And so if we do that for all of the points in here, you can see, so um, on the x-axis here is the actual point, on the um, y-axis is the predicted point. And you can see, so this is the one for our um, example here, but if I map out all of them, you can see there's a fair bit of um, variability here. So there's some correlation, um, but there's a lot of stuff that's being missed, right? Because of the, the lack of having the distance from home. Um, however, if we do it the other way around, so if we take the um, points on the shadow manifold for um, affect, now all of the information about distance from home and season is in here. And so when we try to predict, we see that we get um, a pretty good prediction, right? We get a high correlation between the actual variables and the um, predictions of those variables, right? So we're doing pretty well here. So, so what this is saying, right, is if it's the case that I can predict the, a variable with the shadow manifold of another variable, then it means that this variable season is causing this variable, which is affect, right? Whereas up here, I couldn't get that prediction or at least not very strongly. And so we're not seeing that. And so we say, no, affect doesn't cause um, the season. Okay, and that's the essence of the, of the technique. So what I might do is just stop sharing there for a moment. Um, and I just wanted to see if there are any questions there before I move on. I realized that was kind of heavy, but. Uh, hi, Simon. Um, can you just explain how, you know, how you relate it, you know, the, the near neighbors from one, from the manifolds to the near neighbors in say, for example, the affect? Um, uh, right. So be, because they're all um, synchronized in time, right? So, so those um, each point on each of the manifolds in, e in each of the time series um, has an equivalent point in all of the other time series and all of the other manifolds because they're related by the time. Okay, thanks. Does that make sense? If, uh, if I may jump in, Simon, I was wondering um, under what circumstances would the results of this kind of um, CCM uh, analysis differ dramatically from, uh, you know, a kind of VAR one model like the one I showed at the end of my slides where you have just a linear model with, you know, two variables predicting each other from one time point to the next and predicting themselves. When you showed the to make it more concrete, when you showed the time series of the hair and the links, yep. I guess that you would see uh, in a VAR1 model like that, that both, you know, hair predicted links populations and vice versa, um, which would, I think, lead to a similar conclusion as you would reach from this kind of convergent cross mapping, right? But in some cases, would that not be the case? Would that not yeah, so... I'm um, just trying to think about what would happen in that particular case. I haven't I haven't um, thought carefully about that. I probably have to have a little um, play with the with the actual data and think about that. But the um, the so so the um, so one one thing about that is when when so the technique I think that you're kind of alluding to is the Granger causality. Is is that yeah? yeah. So in the Granger causality, um, what you're doing right is you're assuming there are no other um, kind of related variables out, out there, right? That are that are doing the the kind of connection, right? So um, so the so the um, in the, the technically what happens in the Granger causality is you're saying that um, typically you compare right the predictability if the if this variable is added in versus the predictability right. if it's not added in to give a sense of whether there's um, whether there's a um, relationship right now the uh, so you've got a whole bunch of variables that you're trying to predict with and then you just take one of them out right now when when you do that the the um, 
yeah, I mean, that can work under many circumstances, but the um, problem right is it's all dependent on whether you've got all of the other variables right. Because the, the um, you know, if, if there's a, a um, key variable here, which is basically mimicking this one that you're taking out, then you get no, um, mm -hmm. no effect, right? And so, um, so there's no way to know uh, that that's, that there's been a, a change there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it's so that's called the selective influence assumption, um, and so yeah, it's just a problem. So so it's much more sensitive to um, you know what the if the the exact set of variables that you put into it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and I suppose it also doesn't capture nonlinear effects as well, which you which you would capture with this. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, typically that. De depending on what model you use and so forth, the so it it doesn't just assume that that you know your whole curve is linear. Um, yeah, it's yeah. kind of doing piecewise linear kind of things. Exactly. So, yeah. So um, yeah. So it's not like absolutely. You know, it's not what I was talking about at the start, where yeah. I'm just talking about putting a, a straight line through everything, right? Um, yeah. But but yeah, but it's still kind of piecewise linear. Yeah. Yeah. So it assumes that the effects don't differ over time, for example. Between two relations, between two variables, rather they don't they don't differ too quickly. Yeah. Okay. So so if it yeah within a short range, it's assuming linearity. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So are there any other questions there? Okay. Sorry, I was just checking the chat there, but that's. Pete's question. Okay, so I'm going to go back. So what I'm going to do now, so that, that's the basic idea of um, convergent cross mapping. Um, but of course, then the question is, where would you get such a um, time series? And uh, the um, Pete's already given a um, eloquent example of how you might do that um, with uh, kind of self report data. Um, but what I want to do now is just talk about how you might do that for other kinds of data streams as well. Um, so, uh, as if, if you've heard me speak about this general topic before, you'll know I'm a, I'm a gun on um, the power of, of big data in order to really revolutionize the way we understand um, human, um, uh, to, uh, understand psychology, I guess, in general. Um, and so one of the things we've been doing is um, developing a um, service called Unforgettable Research Services which is um, really designed to try to um, make these kind of really big data sets um, available to people. Um, so both, you know, make it easier to collect them and, and uh, easier to um, analyze them. So, uh, so we've been building up our um, service and the service essentially connects people. So, you know, one of the problems, right, is, um, what you really like is really long sequences. So you'd, you'd like to have, um, you know, people who are kind of constantly collecting um, various different kinds of data, you know, potentially over um, decades, right? And, um, but certainly over years and, and et cetera, right? Which is, is quite difficult to achieve um, currently. Um, and so what we've been doing is, you know, rather than kind of, you know, having a set of, of participants and then kind of discarding them and moving on to a new set of participants. Um, we're trying to build up a, a um, set of participants, you know, something like a mechanical Turk or a, a um, or a prolific academic, um, but where instead of um, the interaction between you and, and the um, participant being about, you know, labor in your experiment, um, now the participants are con constantly collecting data um, and what they're doing is licensing that data um, to you um, for use in your analysis. So, um, so our participants kind of build this, this kind of data asset um, and they, um, you know, and that may go over many years. So um, we have people in our system who've been collecting for over five years now. And, um, and then uh, they, you know, they're um, able to license that data to you. So we have about um, 4,000 participants in the pool um, at the moment. And um, 
they're able to collect from um, some 600 different sources. So um, we have an app, so um, we can uh, get uh, GPS locations, we can get accelerometry, we can get um, uh, short um, audio segments, um, we can get button presses. Um, SEMA 3 is um, integrated um, as well. So um, the stuff that Pete was talking about, we can integrate in. Um, we've got rescue time, which allows us to do like time use on a, um, a daily basis. So how much time are you doing social media? How much time are you on communication, on Zoom and so forth? Um, we can do uh, text messages, phone messages. Um, we can get people's emails. We can get their Facebook posts, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we can, there's a bunch of uh, wearables that are in the system. So we can get Fitbit data like step counts and things like that. Um, and uh, now we can um, get uh, what sites people are um, visiting as they um, navigate through the web um, and also uh, what searches they, um, they launch. So what kind of topics they're interested in um, at any given time. Um, and just recently, one of the things we've done is added in the capacity to um, get uh, kind of retrospective data. So um, all of the, the major platforms like Google and, and um, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, for instance, um, a user has to be allowed to uh, download their um, data. So that's a you know, consequence of, of things like the GDPR. And um, so what we've um, integrated into our system is the capacity for a user to download their data from Google or from Facebook or Twitter or Instagram um, and then upload it into Unforgettable Me. And so that means that um, we're now able to get historical um, data that goes back, you know, well, as long as someone's been using um, those services. So, you know, for me, that's decades now. Um, so the uh, so so that's a kind of new capacity and and one that greatly increases the reliability um, of our uh, approach because well firstly it gives us much longer um, time series but it also means that it's it's just one time that um, somebody's uh, the user is interacting with us we don't have to be um, constantly um, you know we don't have to worry about what kind of phone they've got and all of these things which are um, uh, challenging things to deal with if you're collecting data on the fly. Um, I just wanted to note too, we've, we've now built um, sentiment analysis tools into um, Unforgettable. So if you've got a whole set of tweets or something like that, then um, the, it'll go through and automatically um, identify, you know, the amount, amount of trust or fear or sadness or anger or, or those kinds of things, uh, plus like positive and negative um, valences for each of those posts and et cetera. Um, so that means we can we now have a way of getting um, you know as a as kind of affect as a consequence of or as expressed by people's posts and so forth um, again you know potentially for years. Um, the other thing you can do in the system now is um, which is relatively new is that you can create your own term lists. So if you have um, you know some kind of construct that you're interested in defining, so self-efficacy or something like that. Um, then uh, you can um, come up with a set of terms um, that you uh, want the system to look for in these posts and et cetera. And again, you, know, you can go back for years um, looking at uh, the progression of people's, um, you know, how people are changing on those, um, on those dimensions. Um, so we, we've also built a, a new analysis um, interface and so I just wanted to uh, quickly show you one um, sample of how this works. So, um, so you'd go in, you'd set up a, a um, study in the system. So that would be done in a way, you know, somewhat similar to Mechanical Turk or um, uh, Prolific Academic. Um, we then, you know, send out a um, query to people. Um, if it's legacy data, then we just say, you know, get this data uploaded. And once they've done that, then then you have a um, your project then has that um, data available. If it's you know if they have to do an EMA study or experiment or something like that, um, then uh, you know they we administer that um, over a period of time. Um, they continuously collect and and then once they've um, collected the appropriate number of events, um, then uh, you they're finished. And um, once everybody's done that, you have your data set. 
Um, and we manage all of the payment of people for um, various different um, components of that. Um, so once you've done that though, you've got a, um, there's a data set there and you come into a, you, there's an analyze button there and then you can come in here. So what, what we're trying to do, right, is we're, we're trying to stop, because we have so much sensitive information, um, you know, we, we can't just be releasing people's emails out onto the internet and so forth. Um, so what we've done is we've encapsulated the analysis um, approach so that um, you can run your analyses without necessarily um, seeing the raw data. And that's how we protect our, our users' um, privacy. So, the, um, so you come into the analysis form, forum, um, you can create um, new variables here. So um, here I've just taken the start date time. So each of our events has a start date time. I've extracted the hour of that start date time here. And then I've created two um, analyses down here. So one is the um, doing CCM, looking at the relationship between hour and someone's latitude. Um, this, this one's doing the opposite. So the relationship between um, latitude and hour. And so you can go up here and get descriptive statistics on those. And you'll, um, something like this will come out. So you can see here, um, we've got hour to latitude. So this is the, that CCM correlation. So the, of those final graphs that I was showing um, for the relationship between hour and latitude, which you can see is quite high. Um, the relationship between latitude and hour is much lower. Um, so it's what it's done in the background there is gone through run the CCM. Um, over here, you'll see there's some missing data. So it's, it's doing some, um, some uh, automatic cleaning on the data and, and stuff like that as well to make sure that you've got long enough data sequences and, and so forth. Um, so in conclusion, what I, what I want to argue is that the real world's complex um, and that I, I guess my argument would be that a lot of the, both the conceptual measurement and analytic tools that we use are not really adequate for, for kind of understanding constructs out there in the real world. But, um, you know, particularly when you have anything that unfolds over a significant period of time, the, um, you know, I just, I just don't think our, our normal linear models are going to do the trick. Um, so this kind of approach that I'm talking about here, which um, generically is called empirical dynamic systems, um, really takes is an alternative that takes that complexity seriously. And um, it can be, oh, yeah, so what, just one other point I wanted to make here, right, is when I was doing that um, example analysis, I was doing it on as if it was the sequence of an individual, right? And so um, one of the uh, I think one of the things that's going to be a, a big advantage of this kind of approach is that you're getting a lot of data from a specific individual, potentially years of worth of data from a particular individual. And so um, that allows you to actually draw conclusions um, from, you know, for a particular individual. You know, so maybe some people, their, their positive affects in the, in the summer, for other people, maybe their positive affects in the winter um, a lot of what we um, do in psychology is that we um, appeal to what's happening at the group level in order to make inferences about what's happening for individuals, um, and uh, which you know might be okay for drawing general conclusions, but um, is perhaps not so great, you know, in clinical um, contexts and so forth, where you really want to know what's happening for that particular individual. Um, so. Yeah, our um, company, Unforgettable Research Services, is focused on trying to make that big data available to researchers. And um, we're happy to chat with anyone who's interested in exploring how they can, how can they can use it. Okay, so I might stop sharing and open up again. Just see if there are any questions that people have. Um. Hi Simon, um, I have a quick question about um, probably about unforgettable. Um, yeah, I think this is really interesting, and um, one of the things I'm wondering is how you would combine, say, an exploratory analysis with, with the types of analysis that you're doing here. For example, um, suppose that you're interested in keywords, right? If you want to make sense of a result, do you provide some kind of qualitative insight of 
Uh, yeah. How, how can you make sense of your findings, basically? How can you do some exploratory analysis? Yeah, so, um, so I mean, there is a, there's a bunch of different analysis methods we have in there. So we have, you know, like, um, uh, you know, PCAs and regressions and, and all of those correlations and so forth. So, so there's a bunch of those things. Um, it, I would say though, it's, it's kind of in its infancy. So there's probably, you know, a bunch of, of things. Yeah, we've only been working on this probably the last four or five months. So, um, but the, uh, so I, yeah, I think there's, there's probably still a ways for us to go there. Um, what really the, the crux of the matter, so I mean, we can obviously, you know, we can put topics models in or LSA models or whatever we want. And we can, you know, we can pull out terms and, and um, you know, give visualizations of the semantic spaces or things like that. Um, what, what is um, less negotiable is um, looking at the data of a given individual. So, um, so if you're, if the qualitative analysis means, you know, I have to pull out the, um, the specific email of a given person, um, where I guess we're still kind of, at, at the moment, we don't allow that. Um, and I guess we're just trying to figure out, um, you know, what we think about that. So, um, you know, it, it would, because, our, you know, our participants are our users and there's an ongoing relationship between us, um, there would potentially be the option of a, a kind of loop there, right, where, um, where you say to the, to the user, you know, these are the, this is a set of emails that um, this particular um, researcher would like to see is that okay kind of thing. Um, but I, I guess one of the things that we're trying to do here is really raise the bar in terms of um, how researchers think about um, the ownership of the data, right? That the, um, and, and you know, it's, it's really forced upon us in some sense, right? Because of, the, of the, the intense sensitivity of the data that we're dealing with, right? You just, you know, with, with this, this kind of data, you just can't be, um, uh, giving it out without some kind of um, of uh, gatekeeping. So, um, so yeah. But I guess yeah. That's that's kind of would be my answer. Is we'd have to we'd have to go back to the participants and say, you know, is that okay if we, if you want specific pieces? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm thinking about, for example, if you have really, if there's some evidence for outliers, right? Um, typically, the next thing you do is like, okay, so is this is this a, this a technical issue? For example, if you do keywords, you might have very frequent terms that are part of a header or something like that. That could really affect all, the, all your findings, basically. So then you would have to kind of look at kind of the underlying, the underlying properties of, of the data. Yeah. Uh, right. So there would be this, con I mean, yeah, if you don't, yeah, that would be a bit of a concern, uh, it seems. Yeah, well, I mean, there's nothing stopping us, you know, doing like a term frequency analysis or something like that, right? Um, so, you know, if it's if it's about trying to um, trying to discover more general properties, then I, um, then I think it's okay. It's the the big, I mean, that's all solvable, right? That's just a matter of getting the right analysis into the system. Um, it's it's just yeah, if it comes down to to, uh, to wanting to see individual records. Uh, and just a, another quick question: um, Is there any way of knowing? Um, at what point you have enough data to allow your analysis? For the CCM, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so that's what's happening. So when I um, talked about that missing data stuff, mm -hmm. so, so what, it, what it actually does is it takes the, um, your library or the, the set of points and it, it actually estimates the um, prediction um, as you increase the size of the library, mm -hmm. right? And so what, um, if you've got a, um, a good uh, set, right, then what will happen is that that prediction will get better and better and then it'll reach some kind of asymptote, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, so the, the test that I have, what it's actually doing is it's going in and it's um, fitting a model of that, um, of that and it's looking to see to what extent um, the, it actually has reached asymptote. Yeah. And if it if it hasn't reached asymptote, then it puts it in the missing data um, column. Okay. So um, so if you look at uh, if you look at it and you're seeing that there's a lot of that missing data, um, then often that's an indication that well e either it's too noisy or you just don't have enough. Yeah. 
Oh, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, we, we've hit one o'clock. Um, do we want to call it there? That's probably a good plan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Pete. Thank you, Simon, for, for uh, putting all this together. It's a lot of work, but it was really, really good. Um, I haven't actually seen CCM explained so so simply and nicely, uh, Simon, and the papers are very dense. So that was yeah. really, really nice to see. Yeah, um, same here, Simon. That was great. Even including the talks I saw at SFI, that was great. <laughs> right. Thank you. Is, is there actually, do you have some kind of um, like a work tutorial based on, like you had the toy model, is there something available that's, that's kind of at that kind of accessible level? Yeah, not really. So yeah, so that's been my observation as well, that a lot of this stuff is really very dense and, and there, there seems to be, um, you know, missing uh, steps. Um, so yeah, but no, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of contemplating, you know, doing like a tutorial article. So um, using that example, so yeah. And that would be great, thanks. Pete, that was a, a perfect intro for, for active and passive sampling. The, this whole thing flowed really well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, yeah, whatever got me into the workshop to hear about CCM, <laughs> I was happy to do it. Um, no, thanks very much for the invitation and yeah, it was, was Fascinating to hear. And I agree. It was a very clear explanation, Simon. Um, so, yeah. All right. Okay. Well, awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.